I'm Arlene Bloom, the Executive Director of the Green Science Policy Institute and a chemist at UC Berkeley. I'd like to welcome you today to learn about an important new paper making the argument that the many thousands of PFAS chemicals should be considered as one chemical class. Fifteen co-authors and I have spent two years studying PFAS used in firefighting foam and to provide water and stain proof qualities to many consumer products. PFAS are known as forever chemicals because they never break down in the environment. Tens and millions of Americans have been drinking water contaminated with PFAS for decades. Those that have been studied are harmful and they're in the bodies of everyone. Indeed, the harm of two frequently used PFAS chemicals has been known since the 1960s, but they we weren't phased out until 2015, and that's a big problem. When a harmful PFAS is phased out after many years of scientific research and advocacy work, the most likely replacements, a chemical with similar function, structure, and toxicity. Our paper lays out how government and business can apply a class-based approach to reduce harm from the entire class of PFAS chemicals, including the large polymeric molecules. And now to kick off this press conference, I'd like to introduce Michigan Congressman Dan Kildee, who's been a great champion leading the charge to reduce harm from PFAS. He's the deputy whip of the House Democratic Caucus and co-chair of the bipartisan Congressional PFAS Task Force. We're very honored to have you with us, Congressman Kildee. Thank you very much. And I, I especially wanna thank the Green Science Policy Institute and Arlene Bloom for all your work. Uh, you've been standing with us uh, since we started this fight, uh, initially fighting to allow airports, to allow airports, think about that, uh, to stop using firefighting foam that includes PFAS. Uh, you've been a great advocate for healthcare communities and I really appreciate your work. And as Arlene said, I'm co-chair of the uh, bipartisan Congressional PFAS Task Force. We've been working uh, for the last couple of years on trying to get better, more thoughtful policy on PFAS to protect our, our water, our land from these terribly toxic chemicals and especially our people. I represent Oscoda, Michigan, uh, which is a beautiful community in the northern part of my district, uh, which was the home uh, to the Wurtsmith Air Force Base. And because of the contamination uh, that the Air Force left behind when it left uh, over two decades ago, that community has been hit really hard. I never would have I imagined after going through my hometown's own water crisis, the Flint water crisis, that I would be dealing with another community deal, uh, addressing contaminant from a completely different source. And in this case, the frustration is that the source of the contamination is our own federal government. Yet we've had to continue to fight to clean that up and to find help and support for the people of Oscoda and the service members who are going to be affected by that for, for their lives. It was one of the first communities Oscoda was uh, to find out that their water, their groundwater, had PFAS contamination. But there are so many more communities that are dealing with this very same problem. And the people of Oscoda have given me the strength to, to enter this fight on their behalf. And so we have had some success uh, in the 2020 uh, Defense Authorization Act, um, which we're working on right now. Last year, we were able to get uh, some victories in that act. It's the vehicle that we think is a good vehicle for us to address PFAS because of, again, of course, the Defense Department is one of the biggest uh, polluters. Uh, we required the DOD to stop using firefighting foam containing PFAS starting in 2026. We created a nationwide study of PFAS chemical uh, contamination. We importantly increased funding uh, uh, for a health study of the impacts of PFAS. Uh, there were some hard fought victories, but um, we've got more to do and a lot more to do. So in the 2021 NDAA, we are again going to be pushing for a much more uh, forward leaning approach to address this. What we plan to use as the vehicle or as the framework is the bill that we passed through the House, the PFAS Action Act, which would protect drinking water from PFAS by requiring the EPA to create a drinking water standard 
the two types of PFAS, PFOA and PFOS, within two years to protect our lakes, rivers, and streams from PFAS pollution by listing these chemicals under the Clean Water Act within two years, to require corporate polluters to clean up their contamination left behind by listing PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substance under CERCLA, the Superfund law. That's a really critical piece in order for us to address, in order for us to address the contamination that's already there that we know about and for which we have a known polluter. In March, I sent a letter with the PFAS task force to Chairman Adam Smith of the Armed Services Committee and to Ranking Member Mac Thornberry outlining our priorities for this year's NDAA. Again, our top priority is inclusion of the full PFAS Action Act. This is the legislation that we think is the necessary next step. Uh, it would increase funding as well. And this is really an important part of this piece. Obviously, strengthening the regulatory framework around PFAS, recognizing PFAS as dangerous chemicals is important. But both for active bases and the BRAC sites, uh, those, those abandoned uh, sites, we need significant additional funding for cleanup. And this has really been a source of frustration for me, and especially for the people of Oscoda that I represent, when we have worked really hard to get even modest increases in resources to clean up PFAS, the answer that we've often gotten from the Air Force is they just want to do more study. Look, we don't, we don't need to study whether or not these chemicals are dangerous. We just need to get them out of the ground. So lots of work ahead. Uh, we can't stop fighting. We're going to continue to work to get as strong uh, a bill as we can through the House. And I'm really happy to see uh, Senator Blumenthal uh, joining us because he's been, again, another champion on this and has, uh, you know, has a tall order. It's, it's important that we, that we get the Senate and the House on the same page this year. And what I've been saying all along is that you know, we can work, Senator Blumenthal and I and others can work really hard, but what is changing the PFAS conversation in this country is that citizens are beginning to understand this threat. When we launched the PFAS task force, I couldn't get a dozen members to even know what it was. Now we've got members coming up every day. This, the public sentiment, the public awareness is going to drive the policy making decisions and, and, I'm, and that's why I'm, I'm so grateful for the work that you've been doing and just ask that in the next coming months as we consider uh, the NDAA, you give both Senator Blumenthal and I the ammunition we really need in order to get this done. So thank you with that, I'll turn it back to Arlene. Well, thank you so much for your eloquent words. And I'm honored to introduce and meet over Zoom, uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal, who really was the first person on the Hill to get interested in working on PFAS. I think four or five years ago, your staff uh, came to us as scientists and said, what can we do about PFAS? You were the first and you've been very consistent in your leadership. And we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us today. Thank you very, very much, Arlene. And uh, let me begin by seconding uh, Congressman Kilby's thanks to you and the activists, uh, the Green Policy Science Institute, Green Science Policy Institute, and all of the advocates who have really, as he said so well, raised the visibility and the profile of this issue, making Americans aware of how dangerous these forever chemicals are and how pervasive and insidious they are. And I wanna give him a special shout out because he has been a tireless advocate and champion on this issue and a lot of other issues too, but I am so proud and honored to be working with him as a partner. And he is absolutely right. We need to use the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. It's the military budget. Think of it as must pass legislation. The nation cannot do without a military budget. And so it can provide the horse or the vehicle that we can ride with this kind of anti PFAS legislation. Now, I want to say, all of you know it, but let me just emphasize 
uh, his leadership in the House is so very important because he's in the majority there. I'm in the minority as a Democrat in the Senate, and we are now literally considering the NDAA in the Senate on the floor of the House. And I have worked with my great colleague, Senator Shaheen of New Hampshire on an amendment that would help to stop the Department of Defense from uh, avoiding its responsibility. In fact, require that they reimburse communities when there are contaminations as a result of military bases and also to authorize the Department of Defense to sue the manufacturers of these chemicals. That amendment, I hope, will have a vote this week. Can't be sure because in the minority, we don't control the agenda. But I'm a strong supporter of the PFAS Action Act and I'm really delighted that he's gonna be pushing it on the House side because it gives us a way of negotiating. Once these two bills go into a conference, that will be very important coming from the House. I want to emphasize also a bill that I'm introducing. It's bicameral uh, with a number of my colleagues on the Senate side, uh, as well as on the House, uh, a bill that would in effect tell the Department of Defense, and by the way, I'm on the Armed Services Committee, uh, that the Department of Defense can no longer buy products that have PFAS. Sounds pretty simple. When there are alternatives, whether it's carpet, cosmetics, uh, all kinds of other stuff, you know, everything from packaging to household goods and cleaning products and all the rest of it, the Department of Defense, uh, the Defense Logistics Agency should no longer purchase products that are contaminated with PFAS for the good of the servicemen and women. We, spend a lot of time talking about how much we care about them, our veterans, our servicemen and women, and yet the Department of Defense, perhaps unwittingly, is contaminating and polluting their homes with all of this stuff that is sold on military bases or provided to them to use. And so this measure would stop, uh, would stop purchase of PFAS contaminated products and require PFAS free products, and they're widely available, as you know, whether it's foodware used in galleys or messes, uh, carpets, cosmetics, all kinds of other uh, goods and services that the Department of Defense purchases. And we're talking here about purchases that amount to billions of dollars. The Department of Defense is one of the biggest buyers of all this stuff, uh, maybe in the whole world, and so it can have tremendous impact through its purchasing policies. And it can set an example and once again, raise the visibility and awareness of Americans. And I think ultimately that's a great deal of what we're doing because consumers can vote with their pocketbooks and their feet. And once they are aware of the extraordinary dangers of PFAS, they will in fact vote at the supermarkets, at their appliance stores, on the internet. And I'll just finish with this thought. Uh, and I hesitate even to raise it in a group of extraordinarily distinguished scientists, but uh, there are real level, there are real concerns about whether certain levels of PFAS can make people more vulnerable to COVID-19. We know it has an effect on immune systems. We don't know whether that can aggravate or the effects of COVID-19 or make people more vulnerable to it. Uh, a number of uh, my colleagues have joined me in a letter to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary Azar, asking for research on this point. We're raising the question. We don't want to panic people with unfounded claims, but it is certainly a public health concern worth raising at this moment when as, as everybody on this call knows, immune systems are so integral to the effects and causation of COVID-19. We don't know exactly how, but we want to know more answers. And certainly, uh, to put it very simply, for a layman like myself, I'm just a, a trial lawyer, uh, PFAS can't help prevent COVID-19 or its effects. 
we know it, it does no good for people. And so that's something to keep in mind. And, and I think questions should be raised about it. But for the meantime, we're going to be continuing to advocate and fight this cause. And um, thanks again to all of you for the great work that you're doing. Well, thank you, Senator Blumenthal, for your leadership and your good question, uh, which perhaps Linda will say something about later. I think we have one of the world's experts on that topic. Uh, but first, uh, we have the pleasure of hearing from Detlef Knapp, who's a professor at North Carolina State University, who first brought to a wider audience the very severe contamination in North Carolina. And I think got taken a little bit from his lab into speaking to groups like us. So thank you, Detlef. Thank you, Arlene. Yeah, I've prepared a few remarks about the science of PFAS as a class. And as has been mentioned before, the PFAS class contains several thousand chemicals that have many different functions. Uh, they are found in many consumer products. And as a result, we are exposed to them uh, in our homes, but also uh, their production has led to contamination of the environment and drinking water at many places around the country. Despite the variety of PFAS that are being produced and the variety of functions they serve, uh, PFAS have many things in common that uh, allow us to group them as a class. Uh, for example, PFAS all contain carbon fluorine bonds that are extremely strong. And as a result, PFAS are extremely persistent in the environment and are known as forever chemicals. We know from past experience that the use of persistent chemicals, whether it's DDT or PCBs, is harmful to the environment and human health. But with PFAS, we're really repeating history. And after decades of unregulated PFAS use, we have now seen an accumulation of PFAS in the environment and again, harm to human health. Also, PFAS are very mobile in the environment. That means that PFAS are not only found near a location where PFAS are made or used, uh, but also at distant locations. For example, here in North Carolina, uh, where I reside, uh, the drinking water of about a quarter million people is impacted by a fluorochemical plant that's located about 90 miles upriver, and the PFAS are just traveling unchanged down the river and impact the drinking water source of multiple communities. And PFAS really travel even further and have a global impact. And even in very remote regions of our globe, such as the Arctic, PFAS are widely found in wildlife and in people. And because of their persistence and mobility, PFAS contamination is widespread. It impacts large areas and it is costly and often impossible to reverse the damage caused by existing PFAS contamination. Often, we do not even know the identity of many of the PFAS that are in the environment. Uh, in many cases, their identity is protected as confidential business information. And in other cases, uh, these PFAS are poorly understood byproducts of fluoropolymer production as is the case here in North Carolina, for example. So the presence of many unknown PFASs at all stages of the PFAS life cycle necessitates really that we consider the entire PFAS class when making decisions about what chemicals we incorporate into products or what approaches we use to remediate PFAS contaminated sites. And with a class-based approach, we begin thinking about the totality of PFAS exposure rather than exposure to just individual chemicals. Because by focusing on the individual chemicals, we really limit our field of vision and likely underestimate drastically the totality of PFAS contamination in the environment and human exposure. 
So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who is scientist emeritus and the recently retired director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program. And she will talk about the health and environmental harms of PFAS. Thank you, Detlef. Um, it's my pleasure to talk well, in some ways it's not a pleasure because PFAS are associated with a plethora of health effects in animals and in people. And nearly all the effects that occur experimentally from PFAS, not just in rats and mice, but in fish and birds and monkeys as well, have also been seen in observational human studies. Effects such as cancer, suppression of the immune system, referring to the possibility that uh, Senator Blumenthal brought up, uh, effects on our reproductive organs and actually on reproduction, preterm birth, preeclampsia, low birth weight babies, effects on our liver and our kidneys, too much cholesterol, effects on our hormone systems, increases in obesity and diabetes and more. Now there are thousands of these chemicals. All are persistent and accumulate in our environment. And when tested, all show toxicity. Even polymers, which may not be toxic by themselves, have to be made from small PFAS. And these small PFAS escape during production and then as Detlef referred to, some of these polymers actually undergo certain breakdown, generating small PFAS again. We've really got to consider the entire life cycle of all these chemicals, not just the final product. And we can ask the question, if polymers never break down, do we really want more styrofoam? We learned 50 years ago that we didn't want chemicals that would never go away. So why are we still making PFAS? And with that question, I'll turn it over to Tom Bruton, who's senior scientist at the Green Policy Research Institute. Tom? Thanks, Linda. One of the points that we make in the paper we published today is that the more we study PFAS, the more we learn about the harm that they can cause. We know that there are hundreds or thousands of these chemicals in commerce and that there are more being produced every year. We don't have the time or the resources to vet each of these PFAS one at a time. And so we need a new approach. The problem with the current system is that individual PFAS are only regulated or phased out after years of research demonstrating their harm. And by the time that research is in place, the damage is already done. That chemical is out in the world, in products, in the environment, and in our bodies. When PFAS have been phased out, they've often been replaced by other PFAS that we don't have any data on. And so that cycle gets repeated. Researchers begin studying the new chemical while people in the environment are already being exposed. Class-based approaches to managing PFAS are a better solution. And a good example of this is the idea of phasing out non-essential uses of PFAS, like cosmetics or food packaging. Phasing out non-essential uses will reduce our exposure and it should limit the amount of these harmful chemicals coming into the environment. It should also encourage adoption of the safer alternatives that are already out there and innovation towards new alternatives. And the good news is that this is already happening. Airports around the world are adopting PFAS-free firefighting films. Denmark banned the use of any PFAS, uh, any and all PFAS in paperboard food packaging, as have US states like Washington and Maine. Germany and the Nordic countries have even recently proposed an EU-wide phase out of all PFAS. And then as we've heard in Washington DC, Senator Blumenthal and others are introducing a bill this week that would stop the military from purchasing a whole list of PFAS containing products. Ideas like these are, are truly the best way to get out ahead of the PFAS problem. 
Um, if we limit our efforts just to cleaning up forever chemicals once they're already out in the environment, it's going to take us forever. And it would be far better to prevent PFAS from becoming contaminants in the first place by reducing non-essential uses of this class of chemicals. With that, uh, thank you. And we'll move on to taking some of your questions. Please put your questions into the chat and I will do my best at fielding them. Okay, so, so far we have uh, a question that says, the paper that came out today urged governments to take the Montreal Protocols approach to, uh, to figuring out which of these chemicals are essential versus non-essential uh, while developing safer substitutes. And the question is how concretely would this policy recommendation be implemented? Does Congress need to require a coordinated government-wide R&D effort or something else? Arlene, I wonder if you, if you have thoughts on that one. <laughs> you haven't spoken for a while. Um, I wish we had Greta. Now, you know, I am not an expert uh, on the Montreal Protocol, um, but I, I, I will say that, that I think the uh, stopping of essential, non-essential uses, which is being spearheaded by actions like the bill that um, Blumenthal and others are releasing today, really is the way to go because, you know, at great expense, uh, we can give people who have contaminated drinking water, clean drinking water. But the problem with PFAS is that we will never clean up our contaminated rivers, our contaminated land. It, it's, it's just too expensive and not possible. So um, PFAS is really a case where prevention is so much better than trying to clean up afterwards. And um, th there is a good paper on essentiality. Maybe someone could put that in the chat that really defines it. And um, I will convince to, to not being an expert on the details, but we can get you an answer from, from, uh, from Greta who, who is. So wish I wish I could do better. <laughs> and I'll just add that our goal in this paper wasn't to be prescriptive about how this idea needs to be applied applied anywhere, you know, in the United States or elsewhere. We just think that it's an idea worth um, getting out there and worthy of more discussion. So another question is about analytical methods. So what are the best analytical methods for testing total fluorine in water? If we could screen for total fluorine, we might better focus our limited resources for identifying areas of water contamination. I think that's a good point. Um, Detlef, could you speak to that maybe, about methods for total fluorine, where they're at? Sure. Um, there are a number of methods out there. The, the two that are perhaps most widely used are called absorbable organic fluorine and extractable organic fluorine. And when those methods are applied to the analysis of water or also blood serum, we often learn that the traditional standard methods that we use for PFAS really only find a small percentage of the total that is out in the environment or in our bodies. Um, these methods aren't fully standardized yet, so that is something that researchers and EPA are working on, um, but the methods are out there. Okay, thanks. Next question uh, is about confidential business information, CBI. That left raised the issue of PFAS to CBI. This is a huge problem because we don't know if things like pesticides and consumer products contain one of the many PFAS. How do we address the fact that manufacturers are hiding behind CBI? Does anyone want to jump at that? Well, I will say, I think this is something where Congress could help us. And uh, I believe in the, the TOSCA, new TOSCA, uh, that was supposed to be addressed, but I don't believe it has been as successfully as possible. 
So I know uh, Congressman Kobe and Senator Blumenthal are always looking for new opportunities. And uh, I think this is a big opportunity. You know, manufacturers often really don't even know what's in their products. We work a lot with manufacturers and they say, we don't want any PFAS in our products. And then they discover they have them because of CBI. So um, very important and, and work needs to be done. So we give it, pass it to you. Yeah, and another, another point is that um, we could use all the transparency that we can get. And one positive thing is the addition of a number of PFAS to the toxics release inventory this year. That, that was something that was mandated by that last NDAA. And EPA has, um, has started down that route. And the more chemicals that make it on there, the more information we have, the better. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, that's something Congressman Antonio Delgado has really been leading on. And on the issue of tox uh, uh, Toxic Substance Control Act, I think that is an avenue for us. And perhaps uh, Senator Blumenthal and I can confer and see whether or not there's an avenue for us. But we really, you know, we depend on the science and the research that you provide us. So if you can help with that, um, we certainly would be, I don't want to speak for him, but we'd certainly, we'd certainly benefit from the guidance that you've given us. And we'll let the science determine how we frame the policy, which is a little unusual to some of the people that we work with. I agree totally. I think that's a really important idea and we should pursue it. Thank you. Okay, will any of the bills being introduced allocate monies to the EPA to develop methods for environmental laboratories to use to conduct testing across the nation in a standardized way? Uh, I don't know that, I, I would have to check on it. I don't know of any specific legislation that is that prescriptive regarding EPA. I mean, I, let's just face it, EPA has been a real problem. EPA has a lot of authority that they could utilize right now. Um, there are a couple of different ways to address it. You know, I always believe that personnel is policy. And in this case, the policy problem we have is a result largely of the personnel leading the agency. Um, but I, you know, if I'll check with my team and see if on the roster bills that we have, if there's anything specific to tasking EPA on research. But I will say this: um, it's been difficult enough for uh, for us to get them to implement what we've already required of them to do. Uh, their their position has not been very aggressive on this point. Yeah, let me let me add a, a point here, which I think everybody knows on the call. Uh, the EPA has been as much an adversary as a partner. In fact, I would say it's been an adversary, not a partner. And so prescriptive legislation of this kind is fine, but frankly, the EPA is itself abrogating so many responsibilities, it's defying so many laws, to be very blunt. I think everybody in the environmental community knows that it has become a captive of the industries that it's supposed to regulate. And so uh, I'm just being very blunt here. And uh, I know that Congressman Kildee being a strong advocate uh, has shared my frustration in this administration. Uh, and I mean really frustration, anger, outrage, because the EPA has really been a part of the problem, not the solution. Now, I just wanna throw in that there are a lot of great scientists working at the EPA and they're still there which is good. I mean, there are a lot of wonderful people there. Unfortunately, the very top is, is the problem. That's a really good point, uh, Arlene. And uh, it's a point that we should make more often. The, the civil servants, the scientists, the public health experts at EPA are probably more frustrated than any of us because their good work is basically uh, being opposed by the top political leadership who are beyond ignorant, they're simply anti-environment. And they, they are the ones who are captive of the industries, not those scientists and others who are doing the hard work. Yeah, we want the scientists to stay and keep working. <laughs> okay, so here's a question again for Congressman Kildee and Senator Blumenthal. What legislative actions are a priority for this year's NDAA in respect to regulating PFAS? On the House side, it's really the framework that we 
uh, passed in the House, uh, which is the PFAS Action Act, uh, that would give us a drinking water standard, and various other, I mean, pretty critical pieces of this, uh, the Superfund designation. If we can get that, and then, I mean, obviously we have to operate on several fronts. Uh, I do want to continue to push hard on the appropriations side of this question, because while I do agree, the most important thing we can do under the regulatory framework is to hold polluters accountable, prevent the introduction of new PFAS into the environment. But we have a legacy that we can't ignore that's continuing to, uh, to damage hu uh, human health, and we can do something about that. So uh, the priority is in the NDAA to get an amendment that, that would essentially be the PFAS Action Act. And then in the appropriations process, continue to push more cleanup money into that process. And you know, the, the I think I'm fairly confident we'll be able to do those things in the House. And then what we need to do is provide Senator Blumenthal the support that he needs uh, to try, you know, which we were unsuccessful with, to try to get some of those provisions included in the final NDAA that is the result of a reconciliation of the House and Senate bills. Uh, let me just add uh, that um, the NDA for us will involve the Shaheen Amendment, which I hope will place constraints on the Department of Defense. Uh, we're going to be relying on the House, the PFAS Action Act framework that uh, Congressman Tovey mentioned, um, and then the PFAS Free Military Purchasing Act. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, but uh, Congressman Kildee and his partners in the House are going to be, uh, I hope, very strong advocates on their side. And we're going to try to preserve as much as we can going into this conference committee of what they're able to achieve on the House side. Um, but we're going we're gonna to push the PFAS Free Military Purchasing Act this week and then the week when we come back from the July recess. Uh, the NDAA is going to be the important vehicle for us. Okay, thanks. Here's a question, uh, Linda, I wonder if you have thoughts on this. Is the contribution in humans, and I assume that means uh, a PFAS exposure, greater from consumption of drinking water or consumption of contaminated food sources? And have there been sound estimates of this? There have been, there have been some um, exposure studies. I would say we need more, and I'm not one who's always calling for more research before we make decisions. but. The evidence suggests that if you're drinking heavily contaminated drinking water, then that will be your dominant route of exposure. However, for since all of us carry PFAS in our bodies and we're all being exposed by multiple routes, um, if your water is not heavily contaminated, your household dust, your consumer products, and what's in your food will clearly dominate your exposure. So there are some studies, for example, that have shown that people who eat more fast food have higher levels of PFAS in their bodies than people who eat less. Coming from the food packaging um, would be the major source for that. Thanks. Okay, next. Most current policy is focused on drinking water. This is true. Is anyone focusing on pushing regulations for air emissions? As we know, that's how many places, uh, that's how many places have been contaminated in the first place. And I think that's a really good point. We know um, some of the big industrial sites that have resulted in contamination have actually largely been air contamination incidents. Um, does anyone know about legislative means of, or legislative initiatives to address the air issue? I'd like to just make a comment there. We know very, very little about the air issues. It's been a route of exposure that has been largely ignored. I think we don't know like how much when people are taking a shower or a bath, how much they may inhale, for example, and chemicals that get inhaled can have different effects than chemicals that are ingested. So I think there's a, a real research need in that area. I'm not aware of any uh, legislation looking at air admissions in North Carolina, where we've had the major contamination that Detlef referred to, we do know that there were some controls put on the stacks um, from the major producer of PFAS here. I think it is an area that requires a lot more research. The one thing we know for sure is that we ought not 
allow for the incineration of PFAS waste, uh, which is one way, obviously, to prevent um, some. And so our, our legislation does include restrictions on incineration of, uh, of waste, which um, would obviously be, you know, an immediate problem. Uh, but I think there is, a, we, could, we could be well served by more uh, really good data uh, on how to modify the Clean Air Act to include more restrictions that relate to PFAS. I agree uh, completely, and I want to apologize. I'm going to have to jump off the call. I have uh, another conference at um, at uh, 115, and uh, apologize. But thank you all for having me on the call. It's been enlightening, and I hope useful. And uh, look forward to continuing this fight with uh, members of Congress like uh, Dan and and others who are such great champions and all of you, just to repeat, we can't say it often enough, the activists and the advocates here are the ones who are winning the day. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Senator Blumenthal. Um, I just wanted to mention that I have an op-ed in the Hill today that points to some very important research by EPA scientists. Um, the same scientists who worked with Detlef to discover the contamination in North Carolina also spent several years identifying um, toxic chemicals being emitted from a plant in New Jersey and that these chemicals emitted through the air, which is what made me think it was relevant to this, have spread all over the Northeast. And the thing is that these excellent EPA scientists cannot even find out in advance what the chemicals are that are being emitted from plants in New Jersey, North Carolina, and elsewhere. And they have to spend years of tedious analytic scientific detective work even finding out what the chemicals are, which goes back to the CBI problem. And they wrote about it in science. There's an excellent piece in science and an excellent policy forum in science and it didn't get any press. So um, having all these press people on, if someone would put in the chat the link to the, th that's not true, there was one article by Sharon Lerner in The Intercept, only one article, but um, I think it would still be worth looking at the science piece and, and talking about the problem. And indeed the Northeast, again, in the soil has these unknown PFAS and not even the EPA can find out what they are. So it, it, it is a big problem. Yeah, that's a good point, Arlene. I'm, um, I'm finding a link to that paper to put in the chat right now. But as I do that, uh, I have a question about biosolids. It was already question. put in the chat. The oh, okay, was great, great. Too many things to watch at once. <laughs> Moving on to the question about biosolids. There's evidence that PFAS are contaminating large agricultural areas due to the practice of land farming biosolids, basically land applying um, residuals from wastewater treatment plants. And the questioner asks, should we be concerned about this? Oop, you're on mute, Linda. Linda, we can't hear you at the moment. Sorry, a um, <laughs> little bit. I, I think that there's already been data for contamination using bio of, of um, dairy, for example, dairy products and cows um, in Maine where biosolids were spread on the fields and um, the, the cows got heavily contaminated, both their milk and their meat. Uh, we know in North Carolina that some of the contamination in some of our rivers is coming from the application of, um, of biosolids, um, not some of it on agricultural fields, just some of it being entered into the water. I think it's important to understand that many of the newer PFAS are not easily removed by, for example, filtration, um, certainly the carbon filtration processes. So they're, they're coming right on through. Again, we deal with the problem of so many chemicals that we have no idea what they are, and we're only looking at the very, very tiny tip of the iceberg here. Yeah, I agree with those sentiments, and I, I want to go to Detlef for his thoughts on this, but I will point out one thing, which is that our friends in the water and wastewater industry always point out to me that that situation in Maine was, was related to biosolids, but it was also related to residuals from a paper mill where they were using large amounts of PFAS perhaps. And so it, it's maybe not exactly your typical situation. 
I, I just got to comment that biosolids have other problems. I mean, they sound great, but probably 10 or 15 years ago, I was really concerned that if uh, the flame retardants were regulated as PCBs were, then the biosolids would all be considered hazardous waste because of the levels that were being found. So, you know, I don't think we can necessarily, we're focusing on PFAS here, but we need to remember that there are other compounds which are involved, for example, in contamination. Detlef? Yeah, I, I, I want to echo everything that's been said. The, um, you know, the, the question of biosolids is complicated in the sense that, you know, we'd like to bin it all into one group and, and the, the sludges from a paper mill may be very different from the sludge from a wastewater treatment plant that has little PFAS industry in the community versus maybe a community where lots of PFAS is being used. So and a key knowledge gap is understanding really the occurrence of PFAS in biosolids and the maybe the irresponsible piece of our current practice is that we spread the biosolids on land without really knowing much what's in them in the first place. You know, we have regulations on metals, but we do not have any regulations really on the organic contaminants, including PFAS or other uh, compounds like the flame retardants that Melinda mentioned. So characterization and understanding, I think, is, is important before we even think about spreading them on land. OK. So to switch gears here, um, here's a question about, about PFAS as a class, the, the big message of our paper. Many past and current legislative or regulatory efforts continue to focus on one or two PFAS, often PFOA and PFOS, PFOA and PFOS. Are there examples of national uh, legislative or regulatory actions that adopt the one class approach? And this is something that we do touch upon in the paper. Um, we, we, so so the, one class, the one class approach has been used for other classes of chemicals. Dioxins are regulated as a class, although there are 208 of them, of the chlorinated dioxins. There are 209 PCBs, they're regulated as a class. Some of the PAHs are regulated as a class. So the idea that we that this would be a totally novel approach is in fact not new. But I will add that uh, the class concept is obvious for purchasers, like in military purchasing, uh, we want them to purchase products with no member of the entire class. I think the point is, is that all PFAS have that very strong, essentially almost unbreakable carbon fluorine bond. All of the PFAS accumulate, persist in the environment and accumulate forever. Even some of the ones that are called the short chains, which may not persist in our bodies, but they will build up in the environment. And we know that non-persistent chemicals can become toxic as their levels increase, increase in the environment. So I think the point is, is that the appropriateness of a class is PCBs, again, as I said, they are listed as a hazardous substance as a class. Not every two, all the 209 congeners are not individually regulated or listed. So I think that this is something, this is a will, if there's a will, there's a way. And I think that we are going to have, it's an impossibility to keep cleaning up as someone mentioned, all of our river systems, our land systems, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and all of these places where these chemicals have traveled. We can provide drinking water, Arlene, you said so eloquently for an expense, so people have safe drinking water, but we can't clean up the environment in total. And I think that's why the class approach is so appropriate. I just want to want to pause and recognize that we're well over the time frame that we advertised for this event. Arlene, do you think we should just keep going? Um, if, do we have more good questions? I mean, people are welcome to sign off, and they might be multitasking, which we understand. Um, 
Okay. We have a few more questions. Okay. Okay. And if people need to leave, um, we so understand. And if you want to keep listening in to the questions and conversation, feel free. Okay. Now here's a question. Should EPA be required to prepare a report explaining what it's learned about different PFAS based on all the new forms it's been approving for years? That's an idea I like. I think uh, Arlene brought this up earlier that the scientists, the environmental scientists at EPA who are researching the presence of PFAS in the environment in our river systems, they're not privy to that information that is submitted by manufacturers in, in getting these PFAS approved. So one part of EPA has it, the other part of EPA that's responsible for figuring out where it's at in the environment doesn't have access to that. And I think more light that can be shined on that, the better. So EPA's Office of Research and Development, which is where those great chemists were that I think Arlene mentioned before, who had worked with Detlef, um, um, has an effort ongoing right now where they are doing systematic scoping reviews of 150 um, PFAS. Uh, those are all ones that are or have been um, submitted to the agency in the past and are currently being um, used. I think those scoping reviews will be available relatively soon um, from what I'm understanding. The, the program office, the Office of Water is doing systematic reviews on all of the legacy PFASs. But again, even if we add 150 and the legacy, which is about another nine or 10, and there are at least 5,000 of these chemicals plus ones we don't even know about, there's a tremendous amount that we still need to learn. But I think getting this information out from Office of Research and Development um, will be very helpful. If I could comment, I'm gonna to have to jump off in a minute anyway, but I think this is an area where um, we do need some more help. Uh, there are a number of research priorities. The, the, the sort of research that you indicate EPA could be and is doing, I think is very helpful. It's also important for us to uh, to keep our eyes on the health study uh, that's underway right now. I mean, we know a lot of the health consequences, but the more fully we can understand the human health implications, uh, I think that's really important. And it's also important that the on-the-ground research that we're funding through the U.S. Geological Survey, for example, it goes beyond the military sites to find um, the private sites. The reason I mentioned those last two is that from our point of view, um, it's really important that much of the research be done in a way that it drives action. Uh, what we have learned is that the way to get a member of Congress to become a PFAS champion is to have people in their district say, clean this mess up. Uh, it's ubiquitous. There's not a congressional district in the country that doesn't have this problem because it's not just about single sites, it's about consumer products, it's about a lot of things. And what I have seen is that and I don't mean, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but you know, just speaking candidly, members who were either ambivalent or somewhat disinterested suddenly become quite animated and quite interested in this question when they hear about a site in their district from the people who are affected by it. Now, you wouldn't think it would have to take that, but let's face it, that's the reality that we live in. So the research in terms of the implications if the, uh, the, you know, the uh, more you know, strict scientific research around the, the, the composition is important. But for me, the most actionable research is research that shows exactly how dangerous this family of chemicals are and exactly how ubiquitous they are in the environment. If we can focus some of our attention on that, I think that's going to be the thing that will drive Congress to take more aggressive action. And thank you all for doing this. I do have to jump off. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think we are getting to the hour. The U.S. Geological Survey, I believe that the last NDAA told the USGS to check all the drinking water in the country. I don't know where they're at with that, but that would seem extraordinarily important because if they look yeah. all over the country, it's going to be in every congressional district, every district. And that was actually my legislation, as a matter of fact. Uh, Excellent. So Great. Well, very useful for doing just what you said, because that will raise the profile, because it will be found everywhere. Well, you know, I think we are at the half hour, so maybe I will take this occasion just to thank everyone, 
special thanks to Dan Kildee for your many, many years of good work on this and other issues, and uh, to the press for your good reporting of this um, so important. I mean, I must say we're in a, a pandemic now that we're all aware of, but things like PFAS are a slow moving pandemic and they're gonna be with us forever. So I, we wanna thank you for reporting on it, for learning about it. And if the Green Science Policy Institute or any of the co-authors on the paper can be of help, uh, our goal with the paper is to help the press understand to help Congress um, take action. So please uh, contact us or the other scientists on the paper if we can help in any way with um, spreading the word and good regulatory action on PFAS. So thank you all for your attention. <laughs>